We are so proud of you, Belforce, the woman said. And the man added that his majesty called him the brilliant magician of the century. The guy thanked them and said that it was all thanks to them and asked if Leah had come. A moment later, a girl appeared and asked everyone for forgiveness for being late. The woman asked Leah to look at the table, which was littered with letters with wedding proposals for the day. The man asked Leah if she liked anyone. The girl answered her father that she understood the need for an heir, since Belle would begin studying in the magic tower. She promised to try to choose someone as soon as possible. Her father said that she did not have to get married and give birth to an heir. He suggested that her brother, Balforce, would someday give up the idea of being a magician and decide to get married. The guy replied that it was unlikely, but anything was possible, and he added that he would like to invent a magical device that would allow him to preserve the magician's mana after the birth of his child. Leah thought their parents looked so happy. After all, they were expecting their third child. She herself was not against starting a family. However, late in the evening, something terrible happened. Their parents' carriage flew off a cliff and they were killed. Leah thought she felt this would happen. At the funeral, Leah and Belle heard people talking about them. Apparently, they had an accident. Their son is a magician, which means they have no heirs. What will happen to them? Yes, and besides, the family may lose its place in the Council of Twelve. Apparently, the title of Marquis will be transferred to someone else. Belle was very angry with these gossipers, but Leah stopped him and calmed him down, adding that he would only give them a reason for new gossip. The guy told his sister that he would become the head of the family, but she reminded him how proud his parents were of his magical potential. I will become the head of the family, Leah said decisively. At a council with the emperor, they discussed that a woman being a marquis was unforgivable, and they should force her to give up the title of marquis, and her future husband should receive the title, not her. The archduke of the empire said that the council of twelve was composed of the highest-ranking nobles. The rest of the nations will begin to mock the empire because of the female marquis. Leah said she would prove it, after all, there is a law that states that a woman can receive a title if she proves that she is worthy of it. So she will do it and inherit the title. His Majesty asked the girl how she would prove this. Leah replied that she would prove it with her sword. After all, she learned to fence from her father, a knight. Archduke Jean Roland joked about this, that the lady considered the sword an ordinary decoration. Leah replied that with the help of this decoration, she could easily bring him to his knees. Milady, your spirit alone is already much stronger than that of the Archduke, the Prince of the Empire Cain Raylan said with a smile to Leah. He asked the Emperor, Isn't this interesting? Will the lady be able to bring the Archduke to his knees with her decoration? If she defeats the Archduke, then everyone in the Empire will understand that she is worthy of the title. Jean was outraged. He believed that this was not the place for a female Marquis, and Cain asked his brother if he was not capable of defeating a woman. The Archduke agreed, but on condition. If he loses, he will accept that Lady Devil deserves the title. But if he wins, then she must marry the man the council chooses. He recalled that magicians lose their abilities and become ordinary people after the birth of a child. And if Lady Devil loses, Balfour's will become the new Marquis. And then they will lose the talent of the entire nation. Jean asked the Emperor if the council did not want to preserve such a valuable human resource. His Majesty praised the Archduke for such a wonderful idea. Prince Cain said that Duke Farrell was absent today and asked if the matter should be discussed with him. The emperor asked the prince if there were really things in this empire that were beyond his competence, and he asked Lady Devil if she agreed with the conditions. Leah thanked his majesty and said that she accepted these conditions no matter what. After all, she must protect what is left of her family. Leah grabbed her sword with a green stone in the hilt, and they sparred. Jean was surprised by her fighting skills and called her more experienced than most noble children. However, the Archduke was stronger, and with one sharp movement he cut her sword in half. He added that now it is truly her decoration. The Emperor asked to leave the battle and said that, according to the agreement, Lady Devil could not claim the title of Marquis. But Leah interrupted His Majesty and said that the battle was not over yet. The girl took her sword in her hand, and the stone on the hilt began to shine. The Archduke shouted indignantly that she was using her aura, and Leah stood in a pose and demanded to continue their battle. The Rollin Empire is a place where magical power has been passed down from generation to generation. For a long time, magic was the basis of the power of this empire. And the more magicians there were in the empire, the stronger it became. However, they had one drawback. If a child is born to a magician, his magical powers disappear. And the empire, suffering from a lack of magicians, found new hope. Swordsmen who were able to handle the sacred energy of light, masters of aura. 
Lorelia, the beautiful secular treasure of the Empire has been found. Prince Kane happily asked his father if this would put an end to all troubles. The Emperor replied that this was a wonderful event. The fourth Aura Master had been revealed. He ordered the battle to stop and everyone around to show decent respect to Lady Deville. The moment Lorelia von Deville's aura manifested itself, her title began to have a different meaning. The inauguration ceremony of the Marquise de Ville was the most grandiose of all the previous ones. Three years later, Leah, as a battalion commander, separated the fighting fighters. She asked them if she would really have to meet with their commander again and report everything. One guy happily asked if they would really meet. Leah replied that he doesn't practice discipline at all, so today she will punish them personally. Prince Keen asked the Duke why he didn't try harder when the Marquise came to see him. After all, if he had done everything right, the club members would not have suffered. The Duke did not understand which club the Prince was talking about. Then the guy explained that this is a fan club, which is for the love of the Duke and the Marquise. That's why its fighters behaved so strangely. Upon learning of this, the Duke was indignant and said that he would report this club as an illegal meeting founded because of dirty thoughts. But the Prince convinced him that this was for the best. After all, they made so many efforts so that he could meet the Marquise, but nothing worked out. And thanks to these fans, he can find his love. From the magical communication device lying on the table, they heard Lorelia's voice speaking about Sir Edgar. Leah said she was very disappointed in him, that he has gone somewhere and is absolutely indifferent to the problems of his knights, and it seems to her that he doesn't listen to anyone at all. Prince Kane abruptly turned off the device. The Duke thought for a moment and asked the Prince if the Lorelian commander really found him such a terrible person. Kane replied that perhaps she hated him even more before. The Prince wanted to advise something, but the Duke said that he remembered that he and the Marquise must continue the lines of inheritance of their families, but he'll figure it out on his own. Through a magical listening device, they heard that the Marchioness told her deputy that she was leaving everything to him and was going to an important meeting. Prince Kane asked the Duke if he wanted to know who she would meet. Duke Edgar thanked the prince for his concern and asked him to leave this idea. The duke left, telling the prince that he did not love Lorelia enough to do such a thing. But Kane didn't believe it, because everything was written on the duke's face. Leah apologized for being late and asked her brother if he had been waiting for her for long. Balforce replied that he had just arrived and he had time for them to talk longer. The girl was worried that she would not be able to meet him. She asked if he had everything with him. Bell replied that he had taken everything and could take his time to get to the magic tower. My sister asked if he was exploring parallel worlds. Balforce replied that their existence had recently been confirmed, and a genius like him could not stand aside from breakthrough research. Leah told her brother that he was such a great guy, and if his parents were with them, they would be very proud of him. The guy changed the topic and said that he had heard about the fights of her knights. Bell asked his sister why Sir Edgar was not doing anything. Leah didn't want to tell her brother how the Duke was behaving. He does everything to see her, but does not even smile at her. As a farewell, the brother gave Leah a box and said that it was not an ordinary one. Balfour said that the magic tower is located far from the capital, and to get there, you need to go through many posts. So the letters will reach there for a whole month, and this box can help them. Bell admitted that he invented it himself, and he called it the box to talk to Bell. The brother explained that any letter that she puts in the box will immediately come to him in the same one. He asked Leah if she liked his gift. The girl replied that this was the most beautiful thing he had done for her. Leah suggested changing the name of the box to Mailbox. Suddenly the Marquise was called. The man said that Duke Edgar was calling her. The Duke said that she urgently needed to come to his office. Leah hugged her brother tightly goodbye. Leah was very angry with Duke Edgar for calling her whenever he wanted. She thought that he had called her again because of some trifle and distracted her from the meeting with her brother. The Marquise opened the box, and there was already a letter there. Leah thought it was strange because Belle would not have had time to write a letter so quickly. She unrolled the scroll and saw her handwriting on a piece of paper. It said, Hi Leah, I am Leah from another world and this is the 63rd letter. I hope it arrives. The letter said that Belle asked that the letter be sent to her. Her signature was shocking, Duchess Lorelia von Farrell, just like Duke von Farrell. When Leah entered the Duke's office, the knights had created a romantic atmosphere. The room was decorated with rose petals and candles. Edgar von Farrell appeared in front of her, and Leah understood that this was her future husband. The girl thought that perhaps her brother was just joking with her in this way. The Duke asked if everything was okay, and the Marquise yelled at him, asking what was going on here. The guy replied that he didn't know anything, and it was all organized without him. The Marquise asked the Duke not to distract her anymore over trifles, 
When leaving, she advised him to confess his feelings in person, since when he attracts others, he looks pathetic. Prince Kane let it slip that their operation was a failure. The Duke asked what operation he was talking about, so he realized that it was His Highness's idea. Duke Edgar did not like this, and the prince made excuses that this romantic setting was the best opportunity to get to know the Marchioness of Lorelia better. The guy answered the prince that this was rather a way to destroy relations between the two battalions. Therefore, the duke decided that it was time to stop this. Leah received a new letter in the box, which said that this was not Belle's joke, and in her hand it was written, A woman is never afraid to start over. It was a phrase that only she knew, as proof that she herself was writing the letter. The girl also read that Belle from her world had just begun research. Leah from another world wrote that Belle left her world five years ago, which means their timelines are far from each other, so parallel worlds exist. Lorelia understood that her brother had created something incredible. She decided to write him a letter asking him to come back and discuss everything so that he would not get into trouble. The girl wrote a letter to herself in another world, asking if she was really married to Duke Farrell, and she signed herself Marquise Lorelia von Deville. The other Leah answered her that this was indeed so, and this man made her happy. She wrote that her darling loves everything she cooks for him. But the most important thing that interested Leah from another world was how Leah became a Marquise. She asked if Leah had temporarily taken the title because Terry was too young. Leah didn't understand who Terry was, but then she read something else shocking. Or did our father suffer much more because of that attack on the carriage? The girl dropped the letter on the floor and covered her face with her hands. She did not want to believe that it was not an accident, but an attack on her parents. Leah regretted that she did not go with them then. In the morning, the nanny noticed from her swollen eyes that Leah had been crying all night. She brought her a bag of ice, and Leah thanked the nanny for her concern. At night, Leah realized that Terry was her younger brother. He is now studying to accept the title, and the other one did not accept the title of Marquise and got married. The parents are alive and happy, but this is all in another world. What happened here? Leah decided that the incident needed to be investigated again. She learned that Duke Farrell was investigating the incident. The girl thought it was worth asking him about the accident. It might be possible to find out something. Nanny reminded Leah that she planned to visit the Farrell estate. The maid advised me to buy treats for Duchess Anna, the mother of Duke Farrell, in a new cafe called Lush, and go to her for tea. Leah listened to the nanny and went to a new cafe. There she was greeted by lovely ladies and began to offer her their best desserts. Strawberry, chocolate, and lemon. When Leah was choosing a cake, she heard everyone around discussing the fact that the Marquise loved sweets, and the fact that they did not expect that knights would eat sweets at all. The girl felt very uncomfortable in this cafe. She immediately remembered what people had said that a woman could not be a Marquise because she was too weak to be a knight. Leah asked the seller to choose the cake for her, explaining that it would be a gift and she would not eat it herself. And immediately voices around began to discuss it. Leaving the cafe with a beautiful box, Leah decided that no matter how tasty it was, she would never return there again. Knights were watching her on the street. They also thought that she loved sweets and bought a cake for herself. The knight still dreamed that Commander Devil would be with Duke Farrell. The girl thanked the Marquise for bringing dessert. Leah replied that she was always happy to visit her friend. This girl was very sad. She admitted that although she is the crown princess, the prince never visits her. The girl suffered from the fact that in her own country she was a princess, but in this country she was like a hostage. She also said that everyone seemed to ignore her, and the knights who were supposed to protect did not come to her. And the lady admitted that she was happy that Leah visited her every day. The princess asked Leah if she would go to Lady Anne's for tea. She really wanted to help her friend choose a dress for this important meeting. Duke Edgar asked Prince Kane why he was following him again. Kane said he found it all so entertaining. Edgar was indignant, as he was going to apologize. He asked the prince if it was not his fault. The prince replied that thanks to him, he would be able to see the Marquise again. It was not under such circumstances that the Duke would have wanted to meet her. Edgar walked through the garden and thought that the Marquise was most likely in her office, and he needed to go there. He noticed a girl walking in the garden. She was wearing a fluffy blue dress and hat, and the Duke decided that she was the crown princess. The Duke came closer to her and asked her how Princess Michelle was doing. He also added if she knew how he could find the commander of Lorelia. When the girl turned to face him, he recognized her as Leah. He didn't expect to see her in a dress. The girl became embarrassed and began to make excuses that she wore the dress she borrowed from the princess because she was invited to a tea party with his mother. Duke Edgar asked Leah if she had been crying and gently touched her face with his hand. The Marquise was outraged that he touched her face without permission. 
To this, the duke replied that this dress suits her very well. At that moment, the archduke approached them and said that he agreed with the duke and that such an outfit suited the marquise very well. Then, he brazenly touched her hair and asked what reason she had for dressing up, and even during work hours, which she values so much. The duke did not like this kind of communication. The marquise replied that this was her personal matter and did not concern him. She added that she was not currently on duty and asked that they no longer show excessive attention and curiosity towards her. Prince Kane suddenly appeared and made a claim against Archduke Jean for harassing his people. Then, the prince invited Duke Edgar to accompany the marquise. The guy refused, but the prince said that this was in order, and they had to go in the same carriage to the same place, the duke's home, since the tea party would take place at the duchess's. As the marchioness and the duke headed towards the carriage, the archduke asked the prince why he called the duke Eddie and reminded him that he should consider his age and dignity. Prince Kane told him that Ginny was just jealous, and he reminded me that he was holding himself back only because of the memory of the past. Therefore, the prince asked Jean not to cross the line. It was very crowded in the carriage, as if they had been deliberately put in the smallest carriage so that the duke and marquise would be as close to each other as possible. Leah decided to just endure the trip, but Duke Edgar decided to apologize to her for everything that happened in the past. The guy said that he really wants her to know one thing, he respects her. At this moment, Leah says to another Leah, My dear is so attentive. He always makes me feel good and always worries that I won't be at least a little offended. Then the Duke added that he admired her, and Leah remembered how three years ago he introduced her to the Knights as a new commander. Back then, everyone didn't believe in her, but she fought and proved that she was worthy of her title and the rank of battalion commander. Leah remembered Duke Edgar's smile. She then thought that he was laughing at her too, Therefore, she decided not to really trust his confessions, but he smiled at her again, and Leah took advantage of the moment to ask about the case of the death of her parents. The girl did not know whether the duke would agree to help her, but, to her surprise, he replied that he himself would like her to someday find out all the details of this accident. The duke took Leah's hand and smiled again. She didn't understand why his expression seemed so familiar to her. By the end of the journey, Leah had already forgotten how uncomfortable she was in the carriage. When they arrived at the Duchess's palace, she informed them that the tea party had unfortunately been cancelled, and she was sending them a message. The Marquise replied that everything was fine. Leah then thanked Duke Edgar for seeing her off, and the guy replied that he was very sorry that she came here in vain. Edgar suggested that Leah meet tomorrow and discuss the case they were talking about during office hours. The girl was about to leave, but Duchess Anna stopped her. The Duchess apologized to Marchioness Lorelia for cancelling everything. To make amends, she offered her second son as an escort. Duchess Anne called Lloyd and asked him to greet her guest. Leah understood that they were trying to find a match for her because her age was suitable for marriage. The Marchioness extended her hand to Lloyd and thanked Duchess Anne for her concern. But suddenly, Edgar grabbed her hand and said that he would not let this happen. The Duke suggested that Leah go right now to get the papers they were talking about. She noticed his gaze and began to understand. Leah realized that from the very beginning, he had never laughed at her and that all this time she had misunderstood him. But why then is he always there? Edgar said goodbye to his mother and brother. The Duchess told her son that she very much hoped that he would do only his work with the Marchioness, and nothing more. The girl asked the Duke if she could change her clothes before they went to the office. Edgar replied that he would like to show her a place. Leah was very happy to see these documents, but she did not understand why Duke Edgar, of all places, chose this particular café. The guy noticed that the Marquise was uncomfortable and asked her. The Marquise asked why he chose this particular café. The Duke admitted that he had heard rumors that Lorelia's commander liked this place. Leah said that the men and women in this establishment could be misunderstood. She felt that this was not the right place to discuss government affairs. The Duke suggested that Leah go somewhere else if she didn't like it here, but a waitress approached them and started offering their signature desserts. In the end, Edgar chose chocolate cake with whipped cream and Leah asked if the knight really liked chocolate. He replied that everyone loved him, and they began to laugh together. According to the documents, Leah noticed that the horse that was pulling the carriage with her parents was black with white hair on all four hooves. Edgar said he remembered this fact, but the girl said that the horse harnessed that day had a white color only near three hooves. She was sure of this, since this horse was very dear to her parents. It turns out that for some reason the horse was replaced and its parents were actually killed. Leah knew she had to ask Sir Edgar to reinvestigate the case. But will he agree, given that the investigation was completed several years ago? Before the girl had time to ask him, 
The Duke apologized for his inaccurate investigation. Duke Edgar then asked Leah if he corrected his mistake. Would she forgive him? Maris Lorelia thanked Duke Edgar for his help, and the guy replied that he was grateful to her for giving him a chance. This look of his bothered Leah all day. He seemed so familiar to her, but at the same time, unfamiliar. Leah realized that her father had exactly the same expression on his face when he looked at her mother. She remembered her happy parents and became sad. The Marchioness asked the Duke if he was afraid that reinvestigating the case might reflect badly on him. Edgar replied that he understood. Then Leah remembered that another woman had written about her husband, and the words seemed to come out of her mouth. Is it really that respect is the only thing you feel for me? Duke Edgar replied that it was not just a matter of respect. Once he opens this case again, he will definitely be reprimanded since he worked on it alone. And it will be quite difficult to form a team to understand the newly opened case, but he admitted that despite this, he would like to correct his mistake. After all, the Marcus and his wife treated him well. Therefore, if there was even the slightest injustice in their death, then he must take this responsibility upon himself. Edgar asked Leah for forgiveness and asked if she would give him a chance to make things right. The girl replied that she was grateful to him, covered her face with her hands, and asked to leave. The Duke saw the tears of Lorelia's commander for the first time. When Leah left, Prince Kane sat down at his table and asked what happened between them. The guy replied that everything was fine, and he was not interested in the Marquise. Then the prince asked which of the suitors, in his opinion, was worthy of the commander of Lorelia. Edgar thought for a moment. Then he said that firstly, she was the only female Marquise in the Empire. In addition, she is the commander of the 2nd Battalion of Knights and the 4th owner of the Aura. This means that a person who could be next to her must be as magnificent and ideal as she is. And once this person enters her family, he may be of a lower status. He would not be able to inherit the title of his own family, so it would be better if he were the second son in the family rather than the first. And also, in order to understand the Marquis, he must wield a sword. The Duke also added that he must understand what it is like to be a commander of knights. Cain interrupted and asked if he would really be okay with her marrying someone else. Eddie told Cain that he would be fine, but the prince knew that this was not so and asked if he cared what people would say. The guy said that she hates him. Cain was glad that this was the only reason why Edgar did not want to woo the Marquis. The prince said that he knows how to fix everything. Lorelia practiced with a sword in the yard and thought about the accident. Who could have done this to her parents? Where the other horse came from? Who drove the carriage and what to say to Belle? A maid ran up to her and apologized profusely for distracting her from her training. But the nanny said that Duke Farrell gave her the gift and left. In front of her was a black box decorated with a bow. Leah didn't understand what Duke Edgar was up to. She was afraid that there might be something dangerous inside. Come to think of it, he had been acting suspicious all day. This unexpected apology and the chocolate cake he ordered just for her. But Leah remembered that his words sounded so sincere. Therefore, she decided not to think anything stupid and open the box. When she opened it, she was very surprised. The gift box contained a bouquet of flowers. Leah immediately remembered the box and took out a letter from there. In it, another Leah wrote that today her beloved gave her a whole carriage of flowers. When another Leah asked her husband why she needed so much, he replied that he had bought all the flowers that meant love in the language of flowers. Therefore, there should be many of them, like his love for her. The girl wrote that now they have changed all the flowers in the garden. Leah called the nanny and asked if she knew what this bouquet meant in the language of flowers. The nanny said that these were inadia, expensive flowers that bloom only in the red desert, and a bouquet of them says, I want to console you. Leah smiled and asked for tea. The Duke and Vice Captain finished double checking all the documents. Edgar told Deacon that he could go home. The guy asked the Duke why he worked so much. After all, love is important. But at this rate, you can simply kill yourself with work. The Duke said that he is not doing this for love. The Deacon told Edgar not to give up right after he sent the bouquet. The guy asked why he sent the flowers in such a gloomy box. Edgar replied that this was due to the Marquise's tastes, and he was told that she liked the color black. The Deacon said that he would not trust these people so much. The Vice Captain asked the Duke why he didn't just tell the Marchioness how he felt. Edgar answered if he knew any other women in the Empire like her. Such women who independently manage their family... Captain Lorelia is working hard on this, but no one recognized her efforts. Her burden is heavier than any of them. So the Duke decided he couldn't ask her to give up everything to become a Duchess. After all, she is already too busy. There was a knock on the door and Commander Lorelia looked in. She asked Sir Edgar if he was busy. The girl said that she would like to look at the materials on the horse. Leah noticed that Edgar did not look well 
and told him that she could go herself if he was tired. But the Duke stood up, his legs got tangled, and he fell straight on to Leah. Leah asked the Duke if everything was okay. The Duke replied that everything was fine, and he was ready to go for the results. The vice captain watched them and thought about when they managed to get so close. They approached a man who led them to the grave. He told how he was thinking about whether to bury the horse, but since the owner loved her so much, they decided to do everything in the best possible way. The duke thoughtfully offered to look at the horse instead if Leah didn't want to. She said it's okay. The man shouted that this could not be. In the grave, instead of a horse, lay the remains of an incomprehensible creature. Leah said it was a chimera. Because of her brother's studies, she had seen these before. Leah began to cry and said that this meant that they were really killed. Edgar handed her his handkerchief. He asked Leah to trust him and promised to become her sword. A girl with red hair asked a guy named Nex how soon they would leave this outback. The guy asked what she didn't like this time. Nax told Idas not to worry. The guy added that she can say what she needs, and he will do everything, even if you need to kill someone. Idas asked how long they still needed to wait for this old man. Nex lay down on her lap and told her they could leave if she didn't want to wait. But the chimera is already ready. The guy said that they could destroy them right now. The girl was delighted and said that the fun would begin soon, holding the bird in her hands. Idas informed Nax that the remains of the chimera had already been discovered. The guy said it was great, otherwise he was already bored. The girl stood up and said that the couple would destroy them. At a meeting with the emperor, the reopening of the case of the death of the parents of the commander of Lorelia was discussed. All those discussing were against a reinvestigation. One representative told the emperor that they could not waste a human resource simply because of someone else's worries. And this seems too much like a personal request. Another participant said that the emperor's approval of this request would be tantamount to a blatant case of patronizing the commander of the knights. Lorelia objected. No matter whether three years or five have passed, if there is reason to re-examine the case, they always form a team to reinvestigate. Therefore, the girl asked right now to be considered an ordinary citizen who suffered greatly and not the commander of the knights. Archduke Jean did not let her finish and said that an ordinary citizen would not be allowed to enter here and that Leah can only turn because she is the commander of the knights. He added that putting together a team to investigate would take a lot of time and following proper procedures. And there has never been a single case of such a quick reopening of a case. Jean asked Lorelia if she really thought that they would make concessions to her. All the other participants in the meeting began shouting that they should not do this. They asked His Majesty not to allow this, otherwise they would all be reproached for it later. Leah began to quickly think about what to do and how she could take revenge for the death of her parents. But suddenly, Duke Edgar spoke. He asked the council if there was anyone among them who had not been helped by the Marquis von Deville and his wife. Everyone bowed their heads and he continued. The Marquise was always the first to go to war when they were attacked. Their house was the first to help with its supplies during crop failure. Many residents of the empire still come to their graves to honor their memory, and regardless of the time of year, there are always fresh flowers there. Therefore the Duke asked again if they thought that people would be against a reinvestigation of the death of the Marquis and his wife. Everyone was silent. Then Duke Edgar added that he, as a person working on this case alone, wanted to investigate it again, even if he was disgraced. The Duke bowed and asked His Majesty's permission. The Emperor asked if he would take responsibility for his words. Edgar responded positively. Then the Emperor stood up and said that he would authorize the formation of a group to reinvestigate and any obstacle will be perceived as opposition to the emperor. Leah was happy. She thanked his majesty, then Duke Edgar. Prince Kane also looked pleased, which could not be said about Archduke Jean. As they walked down the corridor with Prince Kane, he said that he had discussed this matter with his father in advance, but he was so stubborn that he even decided that everything was useless. Archduke Jean caught up with them and asked Lorelia to go with him for a minute. Duke Edgar was against it, so Jean said that he would like to help the investigation team. The Duke asked him what kind of help he offered. Jean replied that he would only speak alone with Commander Lorelia. Leah asked his lordship what he meant by help. Archduke Jean asked the girl to stop being afraid of him, since he had come to apologize. Jean admitted that Sir Edgar's words at today's meeting had given him a lot to think about. He said he understood how she suffered all this time. The Archduke came close to Leah and said that it was hard for her after the death of her parents, and he complicated everything even more. Jean admitted that he was sorry. Leah told him that she was fine. Then the Archduke said that he could help their group with the investigation. Since Balforce is currently absent, he said that they need a magician. Archduke Jean reminded Leah that the Ministry of Magic was under his jurisdiction. They will need someone very competent, 
so he will send an archmage to help them. The guy asked Lorelia if she would accept his proposal. The girl responded positively and thanked the archduke for his help. As he left, the archduke turned and told Leah that the previous marquis, her father, was a very important person for him too. Leah didn't know if he was telling the truth. Prince Cain ran up to Captain Lorelia and asked if she was okay. Leah said that he offered to send an archmage to help with the investigation. Cain suggested that he simply wanted to assign his subordinate to them. Leah told the prince what the archduke had said about her parents. The prince said it was very interesting. Perhaps Archduke Jean received an omen of imminent death. Duke Edgar added that they needed to proceed very carefully. After all, Archduke Jean never makes his move without a reason. Edgar asked Captain Lorelia if she was sure everything was okay, as she looked a little confused. Leah replied that everything was fine, and thanked the Duke for helping her achieve justice. She said she didn't know he loved her parents too. Lorelia remembered the letters from the other Leah about her parents, who are now alive in her world, and burst into tears. The prince and duke became worried because of her tears. The duke told Leah that he was sure that her parents would be very happy if they saw what a strong and courageous woman she had become. Leah saw the duke's hand trembling on her shoulder and thought that he was even worse off than she was. She told him that she didn't think he was so kind to her. Commander Lorelia admitted to Duke Edgar that she always considered him very arrogant and did not even think that he had such a kind heart. The girl apologized for having once been too rude to him and said that she was terribly sorry. The guy replied that she didn't need to apologize and that she could be understood. The duke said that everything was fine and smiled. Commander Lorelia apologized to everyone and said that she urgently needed to leave to take care of some matters. But in fact, Leah walked out the door and could not forget his look and smile. She felt like she was going crazy because she considered Edgar the most handsome of all men. Sitting at the table, Duke Edgar said that today they had all gathered here to investigate the circumstances surrounding the death of the previous Marquis and his wife. The Duke said that he wanted to introduce someone. This girl, Archmage Katie, is from the Ministry of Magic, so he asked everyone to be more polite to her. Katie welcomed everyone to the table and said that she was honored to be part of the investigation of this case with them. Duke Edgar said that Katie is the sister of Her Imperial Highness Princess Michelle. The guys noticed that her smile seemed so familiar to them. Vice Captain Deacon admitted to Katie that she was amazing, and he added that he admires her since she came here from distant lands and became the head of the Ministry of Magic. The girl thanked everyone for the compliments and asked the destruction to get back to business. She said that they would be able to find the magician who created the chimera. To do this, you need to examine the remaining mana in the skeleton. However, there is a small problem. This is a rather lengthy process since the skeleton is quite old, and it will take a long time to extract mana from it. Lorelia asked how long it was. Katie replied that it would take at least three months. Duke Edgar said it was longer than they had expected. Therefore, we need to come up with something else so as not to waste so much time. The vice captain recalled that the commander had already investigated everything three years ago, and the coachman was killed. Everything happened in a remote, deserted place, and there were no witnesses. Then the duke suggested double-checking the documents they had. Leah asked to provide her with these documents because she has one source. The duke was surprised by this, and the girl said that she would explain everything later. Leah came home and wrote a letter to the other Leah. She admitted that she wanted to tell her something that she couldn't write about before, that her parents died in that accident. Her stories about her parents were so interesting that Leah felt connected to her parents, as if they were alive and well. But now she needs help. She said that they reopened the case of their death, but since there are no leads, she asks her to share information about the criminal, because she trusts her as she trusts herself. Leah from another world quickly responded, but unfortunately she could not help. Her father and Edgar did not tell her much about the criminal. Therefore, she only knew that the magician who created the Chimera was hiding in the Red Desert. This was the only thing she managed to find out. Leah decided that she would find the culprit, no matter the cost. But Duke Edgar said that she should stay in the palace. The Marquise was against it, but the Duke said that at least one commander of the knights should remain in the palace. Then Leah invited him to stay. After all, she is the one who should lead the investigation. In addition, he will be able to protect the palace. Edgar did not answer, and Leah said that she was the one who received this information. Therefore, if the information turns out to be false, she will alone be responsible for it. The Duke asked if she knew how dangerous the Red Desert was. Edgar accidentally mentioned that the Red Desert is dangerous for women. The Marquise was upset and reminded him how many times she had heard such things. People were concerned that she was a woman, but she went through it all. Leah admitted that she thought that he was the only one who saw her as a knight. 
Lorelia said that if this was the order of the commander of the 1st Battalion, then she would unquestioningly carry it out. She added that she was confident that they themselves would catch the criminal, and left. Balforce was worried that Leah never answered him. His childhood friend, the magician Nana, said that he was too worried about this. Nana assumed it was a simple malfunction of the magic instrument, but Bell objected, because his letters were sent regularly, and he used mana stones so that nothing would break. Then Nana said that if the instrument was working properly, then perhaps the problem was with the Marquise itself. And that, most likely, she is very busy with her nightly affairs. Bell thought he should return home. Nana asked if the elders would allow him, since he only arrived here a week ago. The guy said he didn't need permission from his elders. Nana asked in horror if he knew what happens to those magicians who leave just like that. They are called traitors, recorded as criminals and persecuted for the rest of their lives. Bell said that just meant he had to be more careful. Nana told him that as his friend, she couldn't stay here and therefore she will go with him to the Red Desert because she cannot survive there alone. Edgar asked Katie if she was sure that someone lived in this desert. She replied that the Red Desert is an ideal place for secretive magicians. After all, the more dangerous the place, the fewer people live nearby. The Duke was worried that his team was exhausted, there was no end to the monsters, and the sand wind was so terrible. The Duke told Katie that they would have to stop and rest somewhere. The girl noticed a hut nearby and was glad that they would not have to return to the village. Edgar agreed, but they had to search the place first. When they entered the hut, there were two people there, a woman and a man. The knights put their swords to their heads, but the woman greeted them and invited them to visit. She fed everyone delicious food, and the duke apologized to the owners. It turned out that they were a couple of former magicians who now lived here in the Red Desert. Katie asked if they had ever heard of a magician who could subjugate chimeras. The woman said that she had heard about this, and the Red Desert is an ideal place for such a magician because after the birth of children, magicians lose their power, and here they can secretly love each other and have children. The duke looked at the couple holding hands and thought how romantic it was. He immediately remembered Leah and thought that he would need to express his feelings for her. But first, he will need to apologize to her for everything he said earlier. Leah sat in her room and was sad. She was very interested in how her team was doing in the desert. She decided that she shouldn't worry, because Duke Edgar was with them. The Marquise noticed how the box began to shine. This meant that a letter had arrived. As soon as the girl read it, she ran to the nanny and ordered to call the groom. She decided to go to the Red Desert, since the Duke was in danger. From the letter, she learned that ordinary magicians were not to blame for her parents' accident. They are members of a powerful faction that wants to overthrow the Emperor. Leah herself was surprised at how worried she became, thinking that Sir Edgar might be in danger. While Leah spoke on her horse into the Red Desert, she thought about what was written in the letter. Their uprising is planned on the crown prince's birthday. The scale of the attack must be so large that the casualties will be enormous, and most of her acquaintances will be killed. This thought terrified her. Another Leah wrote that there is a magician hiding in the Red Desert who is able to subjugate chimeras. Therefore now Leah was jumping there as fast as she could. Edgar fought with the chimera and wounded it. The owner of the hut was upset that his creation was injured. His wife told him to end things with them. When the Chimera attacked the Duke again, she wounded him until he bled and grabbed him with her paws. Leah managed to run up and deal with the Chimera, and thereby saved Duke Edgar. Leah knew that the Chimera's vulnerable points were located throughout her body, and if you don't hit the places where they connect, it will regenerate. Belle and Nana noticed a couple watching the battle between Leah and the Chimera. They immediately recognized them as the exiled magicians Nex and Idis. Idis said goodbye to them and disappeared along with the guy. When Leah dealt with the Chimera, Belle ran up to his sister and asked if she was okay. But the first thing she asked her brother was how Duke Edgar was doing. Belle said Nana took over his treatment. Leah immediately ran to the Duke to ask how he was feeling. Edgar admitted that he was ashamed of his behavior. He apologized for telling her then that it would be difficult for a woman to survive in the desert. The Duke admitted that his anxiety about her spoke for him then. Therefore, he waited to meet her to apologize. Leah told Edgar that he could go on a date with her to make amends. The Duke did not know what to answer. Idis was angry that the Duke and Marchioness were so close to them, but the two wizards prevented them. The guy replied that she would have one last chance. Don't forget, there is our spy in their ranks. Therefore, when the time comes, try not to make a mistake, Archduke Jean told the sorceress. Prince Kane sat over Edgar's bed and wailed that he could not die like this. The guy admitted that he couldn't live without his best friend. In addition, the Archduke's actions are becoming increasingly strange and he added that he could not leave this world without going on a date with Commander Lorelia. 
Edgar woke up and said that he must return home. Then he asked what the prince meant by the Archduke's strange actions, whether he had become stronger. Cain responded that on the contrary, he does absolutely nothing. He simply became a recluse, just like then, 15 years ago. Then they tried to poison his father, the emperor, and the previous Archduke also became a recluse before the last incident. Edgar put his hand on the prince's shoulder and told him not to worry, because he would protect him just as he did then. At that moment, Leah looked into their room. She came to visit Duke Edgar. The girl asked how he was feeling. The Duke admitted that he was okay only because of her. After all, if she had not arrived in time, he most likely would have died. Leah told him that there was no need for thanks. And besides, she was glad to meet Belle in the Red Desert. The guy asked what about their date that she was talking about. Leah admitted that at that moment she was overcome by emotions and said a lot of unnecessary things. She asked him to forget about it. After all, he is a duke, and she is a marquise, and each of them has their own destiny, so they still cannot get engaged. Edgar asked what would happen if he gave up his title. The duke asked Leah again if she would give him a chance to be her companions, in that case. The marquise replied that instead of a date, she wanted to invite him to her home. Her brother Bell was waiting for them at Leah's house. He showed the duke the box at Leah's request. Edgar said that it was just a precious box. And Balforce explained to him that this box is a mailbox connecting them with a parallel world. Leah confirmed her brother's words. She knew it was hard to believe, but that's why she called the Duke here to explain everything to him. Leah handed Edgar all of Leah's letters from another world. The Duke read the letters, but could not believe in the existence of parallel worlds. Bell told him that they are now being actively studied in the Magic Tower, and magicians are trying to find a way to contact them. The guy added that this box connects them to a parallel world, and he has to find out how this happened. Edgar noticed how the box began to shine. He opened it and saw that the letter had indeed arrived. In the letter, another Leah asked to be careful at the prince's birthday. After all, in her world many people lost their lives that night, even Princess Michelle, and when the sun rises many will lose their heads, including the instigator of this riot. Archduke Jean is publicly executed. Duke Edgar read about all this, and did not know how to react to it. Leah asked him to trust them and this girl from another world. After all, it was she who told about the criminals in the desert. The Marquise wanted Edgar to believe her. The guy replied that he believed her, no matter what she said. However, the Duke told Leah and Belle that it would be difficult to report the riot based on letters alone. He suggested collecting more evidence before notifying the prince about this. Edgar also added that they need to learn more about these magicians. Leah told him that she had an idea about this. She remembered how powerful the magicians were when she fought the Chimera. Therefore, Leah asked if the Duke could train her in using Aura. The Duke agreed with pleasure, adding that he himself wanted to ask about it. While they were talking in the room, a Chimera flew outside the window. Princess Michelle was happy that Leah would see Duke Edgar alone every day. Katie said it would just be practice. Leah confirmed Katie's words about the training and added that Belle would also be present there. Katie asked Leah about the three of them training together. Michelle again started talking about the opportunity for Leah to get closer to the Duke. After all, she will be in physical contact with her, and this will be a chance to find out how her heart will feel. If it begins to pound very, very strongly at the touch of his hand, then she will immediately understand that this is love. Edgar held Leah's sword hand while standing behind her, and said that if she could strengthen the aura around her sword, she would be able to control it freely. Leah almost fainted from his touch, and Edgar caught her. At that moment, they noticed a magician riding a large chimera. The magician asked them where Balforce was. The guy admitted that according to the information he has, Balforce should be here. Next pointed his three-headed chimera at them and ordered it to trample them. Edgar shouted to Leah that even cutting the joints had no effect. They noticed that this chimera's regeneration was much better than before. The Marquis shouted to him that she thought it was necessary to strike one fatal blow. During the battle with the chimera, Leah noticed the nanny running out of the house. She screamed for the nanny to go to Balforce, but the nanny told her that she was here because Belle was missing. Nana sent a message about this. Nax said it looked like the woman had decided to do things her way. Leah asked what that meant. The Marquise was distracted and the Chimera attacked her. Duke Edgar got angry and cut off a limb of the Chimera. Nax was upset that the Duke attacked his creation again and said that he would not forgive him for this. As they fought each other, Leah thought that if things continued like this, it would be a battle of attrition. But when the caller is distracted, opportunities arise. Now the magician is focused on Sir Edgar, and if she can strengthen the aura around the ball, then she can use it more freely. All that was needed was one fatal blow, and she delivered it. 
Nax could not believe that the Marquise had killed his best and most powerful creation. Leah grabbed him by the throat and asked where her brother was. He said he didn't know, and he added that it was her brother who forced him to do all this. And the attack on her parents, too. But Leah said she knew he was lying, and it was he who killed her parents. Nax swore that he was only following instructions and that the Orderer was Belforce. Suddenly, from afar, someone directed their magic at Nex and he disappeared. Edgar told Leah that the first thing to do was to examine her wound, and then everything else. Standing in the hall among the mirrors, Archduke Jean said that he would like to start with good news. They finally managed to capture Belforce von Deville. He told everyone present in the mirrors that this happened thanks to Master Katie. When the meeting ended, Nax and Idas walked out of the mirror towards the Archduke. Jean asked the magicians how long they would disappoint him. Nax replied that they were too strong, so much so that even if you attack together, you won't win. Idas asked Nax if he had really forgotten about what happened 15 years ago. She said that he must believe in the free world that the Archduke would create. Then they will be free from magic, and will be able to leave this unfortunate red desert, and not hide from everyone in the Empire. Archduke Jean asked if they would fail him this time. Katie replied how they could show their strength if they kept making mistakes. Jean asked Master Katie to tell them their next plan of action. The magician said that in three days she plans to set a trap for the Marquise. She will say that she has found clues indicating that Balforce is in the Red Desert and will only send the Marquise there. And there they will have to deal with it. Ergetzercheg liked her plan and told Nex and Idas that this was their last chance and his last warning, and he would not forgive any more mistakes. Katie informed Leah that Balforce's trace had been found. Leah asked if everything was okay with her brother. The magician replied that she was not exactly sure, so she needed to check something. The girl added that the last time his magical signature was seen was in the Red Desert. Lorelia immediately jumped up from the table and announced that she would go there. Edgar insisted that he should go with her, but Leah said that she could handle it herself, and the magician Katie insisted that the Duke stay here to protect the palace. Leah asked Sir Edgar not to worry, because Nana and his two deputies would be with her. The Duke gave in and said that he would inform His Highness about this situation. Magician Katie entered her laboratory and walked to the mirror. She told the silhouette in the mirror that the trap was set as planned. In a week, Commander Lorelia will leave for the desert. Katie said that Nana could go with Leah, but she would use magic to give herself an advantage. Commander Lorelia emerged from the mirror and told Mage Katie that they had realized that she was a spy for the Archduke. Duke Edgar, Prince Kane, and Nana entered the room. Nana said that the operation went perfectly, and her magic worked perfectly, and the intuitions of the Marquise and Duke Edgar were correct. Duke Edgar told Katie that she was in a safe magical trap, and they need to come to an agreement, because her life and the life of her sister, Princess Michelle, are at stake. Leah pointed a sword at the girl and asked where her brother was. A couple of days before, they told Prince Kane everything. They realized that it was Katie who reported everything to the Archduke. When the magician Katie left her laboratory, the room was checked for traces of her magic, and a barely noticeable mark remained on the mirror. That's how they realized that it was shadow magic. Therefore, Leah once again asked Katie where Balforce was and directed a stream of her magic at her. Katie returned it with magic directed at the mirror, and Bell fell out of the mirror onto the floor. Nana rushed to his side to take care of her friend, and Leah told Katie everything they know about the night her sister, Princess Michelle, might die and about the magic box, too. Prince Kane told Katie that since she already knows about the uprising, she should choose the right side. Leah asked the girl why she did this. Katie said it was all because of the title. Whatever she does to prove her skills, it doesn't make any sense. Even the fact that she became a master. Even though she is an archmage, she is still called a princess. And Michelle is the crown princess, but her husband never visits her. In person, everyone admires them and treats them like princesses of another country but everyone knows the truth that they are just hostages. The girl said that the Archduke promised that they would be treated with all the respect they deserve. The Duke was surprised by what she checked for him. Edgar asked if she really thought the Archduke would keep his promise. After all, his father organized an uprising 15 years ago, but Jean was able to get out. The Duke added that if Jean really wanted to take care of them, he would not have allowed Princess Michelle to die. Katie didn't want to believe it. Prince Kane approached her and said that he was very sorry. He apologized for not paying attention to their problems with Princess Michelle. The prince promised to help them if she helped prevent a riot. He asked again if Katie would help them, but she was silent and tears were streaming down her cheeks. Edgar told Leah that he was glad that her brother was okay, and they were able to save her precious tears. He then added that he really wished they had found Balfour sooner. Leah replied that he could make amends by becoming her partner at the holiday. Edgar was happy, because he wanted this, 
and the guy hugged Leah, pressing her tightly to him. Magician Katie told Princess Michelle that she should be careful and be sure to take with her the butterfly pin she gave her. Katie cast a protective spell on the pin. Princess Michelle was worried whether her sister had the equipment to protect herself. The girl replied that she would now leave for a while and then return closer to the beginning of the celebration of His Highness's birthday. Michelle asked her sister to be careful. Michelle began to cry and said that she would not survive if something happened to her sister. Prince Kane reassured her and handed her a handkerchief. He said that Katie was just going to the Magic Tower with Nana, and from what he saw, her sister's skills, like Nana's, were quite good. Therefore, the prince once again asked Michelle to stop crying and not worry, because she looks much more beautiful when she smiles. The girl melted at these words. Leah and Edgar met for a walk around the city. They visited various interesting places and cafes and had a fun time. Then the Duke said that he had prepared something for her. They entered the studio and were greeted by the owner. She said that Lorelia's dress was already ready. It was made by special order of the Duke. It turned out that the Duke gave orders to sew a dress that does not hinder movement and even provided an approximate design. The Duke whispered to her that it was for battle. He also instructed to use only high-quality materials. The owner of the studio suggested that Leah try it on right now. Leah looked beautiful in this fluffy blue dress. The owner told her that the dress was sewn so that the bottom edge could be torn off. The heels on the shoes were made wider, specifically to make them more stable. The owner also mentioned that they would add armor to the corset. The Duke thanked her for her excellent work. Edgar kissed Leah's hand and said that she would shine brighter and more beautiful than anyone on this day. The Marquise looked at the Duke with a smile. The next day, Leah was late for the Duke's training because she caught the knights following her. She brought and showed Edgar the listening device. The Marchioness asked the Duke if he knew anything about this. Edgar said that he asked His Highness not to do this. Leah thought that the Prince did not trust her. But Edgar admitted that the wiretapping was installed because he had feelings for her, and the Prince wanted to help them get closer. Leah abruptly turned to leave and said that she was postponing the training until tomorrow. But the Duke grabbed her hand and asked her to listen to him. Because if not now, then when? Edgar told Leah that he was in love with her and he promised to make sure that she saw in him not only a duke or the commander of the 1st Battalion, but also a man. As Leah sat in her room, she opened the box and read a letter from the other Leah. There she asked how her date with Duke Edgar went. The girl wrote that she was glad that everything was fine with them. She revealed that her engagement to the duke in her world was her parents' idea. But after they spent time together, the duke asked her if she wanted to marry him. And if not, he will call off the engagement, no matter what is at stake. Therefore, the other Leah believes that their marriage is based on love. Leah, reading the letter, remembered how Edgar swore to become her sword, then how he confessed his love to her. She realized that she urgently wanted to see him and ran to Sir Edgar. Leah ran into the training room where the Duke was training and threw herself into his arms. The Duke asked what happened, and the Marchioness thanked him for everything he had done for her. She admitted that she was jealous of Leah's happy life from another world. After all, her parents are alive there and she didn't have to go through everything that happened, and she lives calmly like a duchess. The duchess who has absolutely everything she needs. Leah said that it seemed to her that her life, compared to that one, was so miserable. But through this investigation with him she realized something. Although her parents are no longer alive, people support her, and she is not alone. Princess Michelle and Prince Kane all treat her like a knight, and besides everything else, he sees in her not only a knight or a woman, but also her real self. Whatever she likes, whatever she doesn't do, and whatever clothes she doesn't wear. Leah admitted that his kindness touched her, and she didn't even notice it at first. She asked him for forgiveness for running away then. The Marchioness told the Duke that if he was interested, her answer was, Yes, this means that she will take care of him too. Edgar was happy. The guy sweetly kissed her on the nose, and Leah promised to call him Eddie. Edgar accompanied Leah to the estate, and they agreed to meet tomorrow to have lunch together. Leah woke up to the morning sun and got dressed up for a walk with Eddie, but for some reason he was not there. So with the setting sun, she waited for him all day. In the morning, Edgar was about to leave his room when his mother, Duchess Anna, stopped him in the corridor. She told him something shocking, which made him return to his room. The mirror people said they needed to find another opportunity, since they most likely already know all the information, they need to change their strategy. The Archduke replied that only the magician Katie had disappeared. The man from the mirror was indignant that this was precisely the reason for worry. And Jean broke this mirror. He told everyone else that they were afraid and asked if they even hoped that their good intentions would come true. But everyone was silent. 
The guy continued that they only lost one princess, who moreover was a hostage, and another person can be put in her place in the Ministry of Magic. But in the mirrors they were indignant that the enemy already suspected something. So, you need to spread false information and then deal the fatal blow. The Archduke reminded them that he had an ace up his sleeve that could easily break them. Therefore, he ordered everyone to do what they were assigned to do. When only Idas and Nex were left with him, Jean asked what they knew about Katie's whereabouts. Idas assumed that she was a magic tower. When leaving, the Archduke said that he would cut off their heads if everything went wrong. Idas slapped Nex in the face, adding that he should try harder because she didn't need such a weak lover. Lorelia came to Edgar's office herself, but he didn't talk to her. He just muttered that he was busy. She said she received a letter saying the dress was ready. Leah slammed the office door and ran away, and Eddie clutched his papers in anger and resentment. He really wanted to be with Leah, but he remembered his mother's words. The Duchess informed him that their families could not unite due to the fact that his father was the criminal in the case of the Marquise de Ville's parents' accident. Eddie asked what this all meant. Duchess Anna told her son that she herself did not know about this for a long time. Most likely the father entered into an alliance with the Archduke. This happened three years ago. When Jean learned that the Marquise de Ville had entered into an alliance with Prince Kane, he organized a conspiracy. Edgar hated his father for this, because he knew and didn't tell him everything. He renounced his title of Duke after the funeral of the Marquise, but should have confessed and asked to repent. And now, Eddie remembered Leah's words that she would take care of him, that his kindness touched her. And what is she telling him now? How could you, Sir Edgar? Lorelia came to the studio to buy a dress, the hostess was glad to see her and advertised all the popular dresses to her. She added that the Duke's suit would also be excellent. When the hostess went to another client, the Marquise noticed a familiar girl wearing a dress. It was Ignis, the strongest mage from the Red Desert. The girl said that she just came in to choose a dress. As if on purpose, Ignis mentioned in the conversation that she killed the Marquise's parents. Leah took out the sword, but thought better of it in time and hid it back. After all, there were a lot of people around and this was not the most suitable place for a showdown. Lorelia said goodbye and wanted to leave, but Ignis asked if she really thought that the crown prince could protect her until the very end, and she added that since he could not protect her parents, he could not protect her either. Leah asked the owner of the studio to leave them alone with this girl. Idis began to say something to Leah about her parents and the crown prince, but Leah put her sword to her throat and said that she could put her on trial for insulting the imperial family. Commander Lorelia reminded that she was a knight of the imperial family, and it was her duty to protect the honor of the emperor and the crown prince. Leah put the sword away and said that she forgives her. After all, she is just a pawn in this game. Idis was outraged by this phrase, and Leah said that she had made inquiries about her. She is the only surviving daughter of a family of traitors. Ingis Portia is a traitor whose life was protected by a tower of magic, the same tower where she ran away because of love, an ill-fated magician who chose love. That's what they say about her. The girl replied that Leah thought she was special, but in fact, he is just the crown prince's little dog. And because she has this stupid aura, everyone treats her like she's done something big. Ignis screamed at Leah not to deceive herself. After all, in essence, she is no one, and she couldn't even protect her parents. Suddenly, Duke Edgar appeared and ordered not to speak like that to the Marchioness. He added that the Marquis Devil was not one of those women about whom one could speak so lightly, Leah was glad to see him and asked how he ended up here. The Duke replied that he wanted to take a quick look at her, but they would discuss it later. And now he asked Leah to prepare his sword. When they fought Ignis, she felt that she was losing her power and resented Nax. The girl said goodbye to Leah and said that they would see each other again. After she disappeared, they went outside. Eddie hugged Leah and asked her forgiveness for not going with her to the studio right away. Still, he couldn't let her go. Ignis was very angry at Nax because things weren't working out for them. The guy suggested that she stop everything and live as before, but the girl replied that they took everything from her, and she was not going to give up. She took off her glove and next realized what his lover was up to. The girl took his hand and said that she would rather give up on him than on her revenge. Now her mana was not depleted by his hand. This meant that she no longer loved him. Next remembered his childhood, how the guys laughed at him. They took his little creature, a chimera, to mock him. But someone's magic saved his baby from death, and he noticed her. Ignis, the one who was left alone because her entire family was executed. Ignis was protected by the tower, so she was the only one who survived. While saving the bird, the girl wounded the hand of the guy who took the chimera. He shouted that her father had poisoned the Archduke and the Crown Prince, 
and he added that she was lucky that she and her family were not punished. The guys left, scared of her. The girl gave Nex the bird and told him to take care and protect it if it was so dear to him. Ignis added that it is better to kill first than to let your loved ones die. Nex cried and begged Ignis not to leave him, saying that he would do everything and fix everything. But she replied that there was simply no more room for him in her heart, and it was filled with revenge. Prince Cain was horrified to see the list of the Archduke's allies. There were many more of them than he thought, and he was even surprised to see familiar names there. He asked Duke Edgar what was wrong with the army. The Duke replied that they could only call on small detachments so as not to arouse the Archduke's suspicion. Therefore, part of the detachment will secretly enter the banquet and will be at the forefront of the battle. The prince reminded that it would be necessary to attack only at the very end. Only when their enemies put knives to their throats will it be possible to prove everything. He added that this uprising must definitely take place. Balforce asked His Highness why Archduke Jean had teamed up with Ignis if her father Viscount Portia had sent his father, the previous Archduke, away. The prince replied that it was because they had a common enemy. The royal family has destroyed the entire Portia family, and the Archduke is hungry for power. Cain told an incident that no one knew about. Fifteen years ago, on his birthday, the previous Archduke himself prepared the poison that killed him. Jean's father gave Viscount Portia a bottle of poison and told him to add two drops to the crown prince. Then he would die at night, and no one would suspect anything. The Viscount said that the Emperor was kind to him and would not guess anything. The ones who found out about their plan were little Leah and Eddie. They were playing in the room and heard a conversation. The men tied up the children in the room. They discussed poisoning the prince and erasing the children's memories using magic. And locking them in the room, they went to the holiday. Viscount Portia greeted the emperor and presented the prince with a gift in the form of a bottle of drink from the east. Cain dreamed about this drink, but he wanted to share it with Jean. The man told the prince that it was impolite to share his gift because the guest might think that he did not like it. Then Cain raised the glass of drink to his lips. At that moment, Edgar ran into the hall and shouted that the drink had been sent and the prince would die tonight. The Archduke realized that this was the end for him and his family. He took the bottle out of his pocket and drank its entire contents, telling his son that he must ascend to the throne. The Emperor asked the Viscount if this was true. The Viscount denied everything, and Edgar shouted that another person was behind it. But at that moment, the Archduke fell dead to the floor, and everyone rushed to him. Little Jean cried over his father's lifeless body. The Emperor learned that the prince's glass contained poison that killed the Archduke, but the criminal was already dead. Therefore, he executed all members of the Portia family. Ignis was the only survivor, and children often continue the work of their parents. Therefore, the uprising must take place, and they have to suppress it. Leah admired the courage and bravery of young Edgar. Cain was grateful to his friend for saving him, and from that day on he never left his side. The prince hugged the duke, who asked him to let him go and added that he now belonged to another person. Balforce asked if the duke had found a mate. The guy said that whoever she was, she was very lucky to meet such a wonderful person like him. And she must be a good person too. Then, Bell asked if he knew this girl. When they told him it was Leah, his face immediately changed. He was upset and couldn't believe it. Prince Kane asked him why he was not happy for his sister, because he himself had just said that the Duke was the most wonderful person in the world. Bell replied that it was for someone else. He asked his sister and the Duke what would happen to their titles. If they trained, someone would have to give up the title, and their family had gone through so much to keep it. Balforce was worried that he was only a magician who could not have an heir, and if Leah refuses the title, then their family will disappear. Sir Edgar said that he would refuse. The Duke repeated once again that if he renounced the title, nothing of the sort would happen. Cain asked his friend not to make such hasty promises, but Duke Edgar insisted on his decision. Leah said that they would discuss this later, because there is also his mother, Duchess Anna. The servant brought them a letter. The letter stated that Duchess Anne was inviting commanders Edgar and Lorelia to her residence. Everyone was surprised by this message. At dinner, Duchess Anne asked the Marchioness and her son if they were dating. No one answered but she already knew the answer. Then she asked if they had thought about getting married. They were silent again. Then she asked what they planned to do with their titles. Edgar responded emphatically that he plans to relinquish his title since Commander Lorelia is the sole heir. His brother Lloyd is worthy to become Duke, so their line will continue. Leah told the Duchess that nothing had been decided yet and needed to be discussed, but the Duchess asked Edgar again if he was sure. She agreed with her son's decision, which greatly surprised everyone. He asked why she didn't talk him out of it. 
Duchess Anne replied that there was no point in this, and if they came to such a decision, then it was well thought out. In addition, she added that she really likes Leah. She took Leah by the hand and said that when she was born, she and her mother thought that an angel had come to them from heaven. The Duchess admitted that she was jealous of her friend, and Anna told her mother that she wanted Leah to become part of her family. But Mom always refused to let her daughter find love on her own. Leah began to cry at these words, and the Duchess put a bracelet on her hand, which had been passed down to her from her mother-in-law, and asked if Leah would accept it as her daughter-in-law. The girl thanked the Duchess for everything, and they hugged. After the Marquise went home, Eddie asked his mother why she was so kind to Leah. Edgar asked what her intentions were. Mom was offended by him, because everything she told Leah was true. But she was worried about his father's mistake, which became the mistake of their family. And now, she decided to cherish this girl as much as their sins were great. To meet the Marquise and Marquise again, ask them for forgiveness, because she tried for their daughter. Edgar, I swear on the honor of our family that I will do everything to ensure that Leah is always happy. Can you do the same, Eddie? Mom asked. The guy replied that he would do everything to make her happy. At this moment, next stopped Leah's carriage. She got out of the carriage and he approached her, clenching his hands into fists. The guy fell to his knees and asked for mercy. He said that Ignis left him because he wanted to stop her and stop taking revenge. Nex said that Ignis is all he needs and he knows how to get her back. He asked Leah to help him because only if he kills her will his beloved return to him. He said that she should understand her because Ignis lost her parents at such a young age. Leah got angry and hurt his face because he mentioned her parents. She said that she would like to cut his throat with a dagger, but then everything would not go according to plan. The Marquise left him lying on the ground and went home. When she told Eddie everything, he was worried about letting her go alone. Leah replied that everything was fine and asked how long ago he began to have feelings for her. The guy replied that from the very day she became the commander of the knights. Then he couldn't take his eyes off her all day, and then he couldn't look her in the eyes and avoided her. Eddie asked Leah how he fell in love with her in another world if she didn't become a knight there. Leah also became interested in this, and she wrote another letter to Leah about her engagement and asked about it. Leah from another world replied that she was very happy for them, and she revealed that her Eddie fell in love with her when she ran to save Prince Kane during his birthday party. This happened when Viscount Portia and the former Archduke tried to send the baby crown prince. As soon as Eddie broke down the door, Leah ran and knocked the glass out of the prince's hands. Leah from another world wrote that her beloved admitted that it was then that he fell in love with her, and since that time he has cherished these feelings. Lorelia read the letter and realized that she had again revealed someone's secret, because this had not happened to her. And then, 15 years ago, she didn't even run after Edgar.